One and all, welcome in week two of uh, this course, Consumer Behavior and Economic Decision Making. In this week, we're going to focus on rationality. Namely, we're going to investigate economical rational choice theories. In this part one, we are going to explore a definition of rational decision making. So that will be the first part of the agenda, rational decision. In the second part of uh, this week, we're going to uh, focus uh, on utility and its meaning for decision-making theories. And finally, we're going to focus on expected utility and risk. So far, I was trying to uh, show you basics of theory of decision-making. So uh, we've been uh, discussing what actually a decision is. So uh, I introduce what a choice that is, and uh, uh, I explain the process of selecting an option. And also, we've learned what are preferences, uh, what influences preferences, and how people may apply those preferences into a decision-making process. At this point, we're going to focus on rationality. So let's think, yeah, what does it mean to make a rational decision? First of all, one of the, one of the most important elements of rational decision is uh, transitivity. Basically, it means that rational decision must uh, not be cyclical. So basically, it means that if we have a choice set S, that consists of uh, three options, uh, X, Y, and Z, none of them can be the same. So uh, X is different than Y, Y is different than Z, and of course that implies that um, Z is different than X. So in other words, we can say that if X is more preferred than Y, and Y is uh, more preferred than z, then of course x is also more preferred than z, and this must be true. On the other hand, if x is the same as uh, y, y is the same as z, and x is the same as z, then this must be true. Of course, if we consider that rational decision involves different options, so basically we need to assume that uh, a solution is x is higher than y, y is higher than z, and of course then x must be higher than z. So x must be preferred over z. We can uh, consider following case. So basically, I can say that I like apples less than berries and berries less than cherries. What does it mean? On the other hand, I can also say, due to my preferences, that I also like cherries less than apples. The problem with this uh, example is that it's a cyclical preference. Because it means that I, or A, sorry, is uh, less preferred than B, B is less preferred than C, but also in the same time, C is less preferred than A. If that would be a rational preference, and of course rational decision making, uh, this should not be cyclical. Cherries should be the most perfect. Based on this example, we can say that if I have an apple, uh, then basically I would pay something to trade it for berries, because I prefer berries more in this case. If I have a berry, I would pay something to trade for cherry because I prefer cherries more than berries. But 
This preference implies also the third. If I have a cherry, I would pay something to trade it for an apple. Because if I have to compare cherry and apple, I prefer apple in this case. The conclusion from this example, if the uh, decision is cyclical, uh, or actually the whole process is cyclical, uh, basically I would either go bankrupt or I would start to death because this action can be considered as irrational. I hope that you see based on this example what rational decision making is. So first of all, rational decision making involves the following. If you have uh, complete and non-cyclical preferences, then you have consistent preferences. Also, it means that if you have consistent preferences and you are willing to abide by them, you are ready to make rational decision. Nevertheless, a third element, uh, sorry, a second element is needed. We need to have rational decisions. Let's consider those. Also, what is important is that when we have a, if you have an open choice set, you need to consider also the following. The following involves a irrelevant alternative. If you have three options, X, Y, and Z, and then of course preference is not cyclical, so uh, X is preferred over Y, uh, Y is preferred over Z, and of course uh, then X is preferred over Z, then basically uh, if you strongly prefer X, uh, over the rest, then you should choose X from the choice set X and Y. The same if you add the third option to the choice set, in this case, which is Z. So you would choose X from uh, choice set X if the cho uh, choice set S includes X, Y, and Z. Basically, it means that, and that's important uh, rule, uh, for rational decision making, that adding a strictly irrelevant or inferior alternative to your choice set must not choice um, change your choice. Okay, let's move on to uh, decision rules and different types of decisions. Decision problems can be formalized uh, in two separate ways. First of all, we can create a decision matrix, or those decision problems can be depicted as decision matrices. Uh, we call them normal form games, or can be depicted as the decision trees. So extensive forum games. Basically, um, to completely formalize a specific game, we need to have the following components. So we need to have a player. We need to have actions. So A. And another P, pace of results. And I, information. Who has which information and when. So player, what are the actions that those players can take, what are their pace of, and uh, who has information and when. If there is only one uh, decision-making player, we call them single player, uh, player, so then we assume that the player plays against nature. Let's see an example. It's pretty trivial. Uh, we have Anna, and uh, Anna is our player. 
Anna wonders if uh, she should pick berries or cherries. She prefers berries to cherries. In this case, she's the only player, so she plays against nature. So we have play one Anna, and in this case, nature is player two. Nature provides fruit. She prefers berries. And if she picks berries, that's basically the best outcome, because nature provides both. If she picks cherries, it's the worst outcome, even though nature provides also cherries, but still it's not the most preferred choice in this case for Anna. So as you see, it's a formal game. In italics we have possible actions and in brackets we have the pace off. The same example can be described in, in this format as a tree, as a decision tree. Anna is a player, she prefers berries over cherries. If nature provides both, the best outcomes is to uh, when she selects berries worst if she selects cherries. Of course it's trivial because uh, still um, uh, we see that only two options. So it's an extensive form of games. In this case, different than in table, we have nodes. Uh, nodes indicate decisions that can be made or taken by a player edges, so uh, you would say lines, represent actions, and uh, basically each branch ends with a payoff. Let's consider a bit more complex example. Anna wonders if she go out to pick berries or cherries. She prefers berries and cherries, of course. However, all berries might already have been eaten by the birds. She knows that's possible, that's a possible action. So what Anna should do? She prefers berries, she likes that very much, more than cherries, but also she knows that it's possible that berries were collected by birds. What she should do? What would you suggest? Let's see a table. Let's see the game. Again, player one is Anna. The possible action is pick berries for Anna or pick cherries. Nature can provide both berries and cherries. On the other hand, since birds ate so um, all the berries, so nature uh, provides only cherries in this case. So. In the essence of the table, in the two by two part, you see that if there are plenty of cherries and berries, Anna prefers berries, and if she acts picking uh, berries, that would be the best outcome for her. She will get the most out of it. If she would change her preferences and would say, okay, since there is a chance that uh, birds collected all berries, if she picks cherries, then um, she uh, will obtain an outcome next to the worst. On the other hand, if she decides to pick berries, but nature provides only cherries, that would be the worst. On the other hand, if there are only cherries and she decides to pick cherries then it would be the second best so if birds ate all fruits all berries and she decides to change her preferences to pick cherries then she will uh, collect second best outcome
as you see here in this example, if nature provides bolts, um, Anna follows her preferences, picks berries, she gets berries. If nature provides only cherries, because uh, birds ate all of uh, uh, berries, then she gets nothing. If she changes her preferences, then she will get cherries in both cases. We can explain this example uh, by adding more information that, to describe the table. So the first action, when Anna sticks to her preferences, she uh, prefers berries and pig berries, knowing that there is a chance that all berries um, could have been eaten, then basically in this case when she does the first action, she basically means that she hopes for the best and we call this decision rule maxima. So she hopes for the best. If she changes her preferences without knowing whether nature provides both, so she thinks that, yeah, let's assume that um, maybe it's possible that the nature provides uh, only cherries. Thus she changes her preferences and in this case it's uh, a decision rule when she prepares for the worst. Maximine. Both rules are rational decision rules. Which, um, which of them two decision rules uh, she chooses depends on her taste. So as you see here, if she sticks to uh, picking berries, what she does, she hopes for the best. Because if she doesn't know what nature can provide, she hopes for the best, nevertheless. But if she thinks that it's possible that uh, nature does not provide what she needs, she may change her preferences. So a uh, second decision rule is possible and uh, that Anna prepares for the worst. What else we can also say about this part? So we can say that there are two ways of rationally solving this decision problem. First of all, it's the maxima um, decision rule. So um, hope for the best. In this case, it's possible to choose the action that maximizes the maximum possible payoff. In this case, she picks berries so she gets most out of it. But only if, of course, nature provides both. So four, that's the maximum outcome. The lowest is one, but only if nature provides cherries. On the other hand, if Anna goes for the second option, picks cherries, choose the action that maximizes the minimum possible payoff. So in this case, uh, maximum is three, minimum payoff is two. So if nature provides both, then at least she gets something. Uh, maybe it's not the maximum, but at least it's something. It's second to the worst. So we can conclude that decision problems can be classified into four groups depending on the level of information that is available to a decision maker, what on the topic, what's actually available. So then we can distinguish between four types of decisions. 
first type is decisions are in certainty. So it happens when it's perfectly known what nature will provide. So it means that we actually know what will happen. The second decision problem is when uh, we know probabilities. So it's a decision under risk. So it's perfectly know what nature uh, provides in terms of probabilities. Then call it risk. Third option is uh, decision under uncertainty. So in this case, we uh, have a partial knowledge about probabilities. So we know what could have happened, what may happen, and so on. Basically, in this third case, uh, there's not enough information. And finally, we may make decisions under ignorance, when probabilities, options, possibilities are completely unknown. So we may have no clue uh, what nature will do, what can we encounter when making a decision. I hope that based on this brief, simple lecture, you've understood what does it mean to make a rational decision and what kind of strategies or rules can be applied in order to make a rational decision.